What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo with Mike Golick Jr. That is me. With me, as always, TV blurring in the background, super producer Brandon Newman. Brandon, what's going on? Hi. Uh, what did you accuse me of? <laughs> Having your producer on in the back, or your uh, TV on in the background while we got started? I, it wasn't my TV, Mike. We have these fancy new cameras, and I was fixing my shot at the last second. I know you have a beautiful television right there that you glance over at every now and then, but let me stop fibbing on you. All right, there we go. We'll stop nar narking on each other because we've got a great show for you guys today. As always, <laughs> uh, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a five-star rating and review and check us out on the DraftKings YouTube channel. You're getting this as part two of the podcast today. We had Bo Allen. Yes former NFL and uh, Wisconsin defensive tackle, stop by and talk to us. Awesome dude, does great work as a contributor over at the Greenlight Podcast with Chris Long, Kyle Long, and all of those guys. We got to talk to Bo about a little bit of everything, some rollerblading, breakfast candy, losing weight as a reformed big guy, Brandon. I don't know if you've seen, but Bo is jacked now after being a 340-pound nose tackle. He was a man of girth like yourself. And uh, he tells us a little bit of the weight loss secrets that he went through. So plenty of great stuff there. He and I reminiscent on some uh, Wisconsin party stories that we were both a part of and uh, the fallout that tends to come with those events. Yes, I loved hearing about your extracurricular activities in college, but I loved hearing all of the D-line talk. It just, it made, it made me, it really got me jacked up. You know, I was I was trying to go to bed editing the podcast last night, but I couldn't help but to like turn on some film, some old footage of myself back in the day. Hearing about two gapping made me reminiscent of two gapping your head uh, during practice uh, all day long. Yeah, we definitely put our hand in firmly in the dirt on this podcast. A little bit of preview of some draft yes. prospects, a lot of talk about what makes a good D-lineman. It's all great, so make sure you check that out. We got plenty to get to with flagrant foulery in the NBA. It's apparently an epidemic now. But Brandon, we also had breaking news uh, this morning. Nick Nurse out as the head coach of the Toronto Raptors, according to ESPN M uh, NBA uh, insider Adrian Wojnarowski. Um Nick Nurse, who was the 2019 NBA champion with the Kawhi Leonard-led Raptors, the 2020 coach of the year, now instantly becomes one of the favorite candidates for the Houston head coaching job, according to Woj. And also, according to Woj, apparently Ime Yudoka, one of the front runners to replace Nick Nurse with the Toronto Raptors. And Brandon, this is one of those things where we see all the time accomplished coaches in the NBA fall by the wayside after the life cycle of a team sort of crests and falls. And with the Toronto squad, the one that he was a part of getting over the top, it was heavily Kawhi Leonard based. Like that championship is about a lot of things, right? Certainly Nick Nurse, very capable coach. There's a reason he won't be on the shelf long after this. Kawhi Leonard, obviously incredibly important star player. We saw some of that show up last night with the Clippers as he was off the court for game three of that series dealing with a knee injury, which seems to be the story of his Clippers tenure. And it was also about yeah. LeBron James finally leaving the Eastern Conference during that season. And so the LeBron James-sized cap on the Raptors' success, remember they had been one seeds in prior years. They'd been knocking on the door and just not able to break through because of LeBron James. And then Kawhi Leonard, Nick Nurse, and that team were able to do so. And on the other side of that, once Kawhi leaves – we sort of saw, all right, you had already broken up the main core of that team and Kyle Lowry and DeMar DeRozan when DeMar went to San Antonio. And ever since then, it kind of always felt like the clock was probably ticking there as the power in the Eastern Conference reshaped around them. Yeah, Mike, the, the Toronto Raptors are a very interesting case in the NBA. I really didn't like the way they treated Dwayne Casey, especially firing him after he won Coach of the Year and not getting letting him get a talent like uh, Kawhi Leonard, he really built that team from the ground up. You talk about Pascal Siakam. I, don't, I know a report just came out. He's one of the most overrated players in the NBA, but he was really good when <laughs> no, one, no one knew his name. And then Fred Van Fleet and all things that he's done, and everyone's looking at him to go join a super team. I am i don't know what's going on in Toronto, but I wish them the best. Uh, Woj said that Masai Ujiri and Nick Nurse met several times at the end of the season to discuss how they might move forward together, but a breakup felt inevitable. Nurse had one year and eight plus million left on his deal 
sources said. And so they're going to turn the page there. It sounds like we are due for Ime Udoka's re-entry into the NBA. We've seen what Nick Mazzula has done with the Boston Celtics. Even in his absence, it's been amazing to watch that team overcome a lot of chaos at the start of their season and get to that point. I will say, Brandon, this entire ordeal with Nick Nurse this morning is unfortunate. Listen, anyone losing their job in the world of sports sucks. You and I both know how many people that affects inside a building, the families of the people that are coaching the team. So I don't want to minimize that. At the same time, right. testing out the new structure of Twitter in a post-blue checkmark world when it comes to breaking <laughs> news, this feels like it actually went pretty well. Like you saw everyone yesterday morning the loss of their blue check marks. Elon Musk and Twitter did their rollback of the legacy verified accounts. And so now I'm now here, raw dog and Twitter again. It's fantastic. I feel liberated. But Brandon, the thing I worried about was what was going to happen with the insiders because everyone's worst fear mm. was, hey, this verification tool was basically fraud prevention. We are coming up on the NFL draft next week. We've obviously got the NBA playoffs, so plenty of news like this is still capable of popping up, and we're going to have to not get a darn Sherford out in these internet streets. I already know friends of mine that have been in the industry. And so the fact that this news came and went, you still got to click the profile, make sure it's woed, make sure all the followers are there and do that. But it seems like this kind of went off without a hitch, which is why as everyone's out here checkmark shaming the people that have paid for it, I'm willing to extend some grace, especially to the insiders, because I need you guys to be verified. I need you guys to be different than the rest of us because morons like me rely on you to come and actually give the credible information. I don't know, Mike. I think I love it going back to the Twitter of old. It's kind of nice to, to get where Draymond Cream yesterday was tweeting after we got the swift kick from Joel Embiid. <laughs> and like, I, I think... This is where Twitter is supposed to be. It got way too much like the AP wire for my liking. I was one of the guys that was going to stay without a blue check mark in in like in perpetuity. Uh, and I try to lose followers as much as I can, but you know people still stick around. But I do agree that this is a new lawless land. But I love the fact that Elon is paying for certain celebrities like LeBron James, William Shatner, and who was the third one? Oh, Stephen King. <laughs> Yeah, which LeBron James publicly complained, Stephen King publicly complained about having the check mark, and now they are part of the three amigos locked in the room with Elon Musk sitting around trading blue check mark jokes under that tab. But uh you mentioned it. Brandon, the flagrant twos just don't seem to be going away in the NBA right now. I think we can upgrade it to full on epidemic. After last night, the 76ers who kickstarted the three game party in the NBA last night. Wow, I didn't even, I promise pun wasn't intended there, but we just keep walking into them with all the stomp and kick stuff going on, dude. Yeah, I was very impressed. I know you're the Segway King and you come up off the top of the dome. I was like, maybe, maybe Mike needs to start freestyling. Dude, it's just autonomous ultra instinct and radio and audio at this point where my body operates without my brain actually having to communicate to it. What, you didn't watch Dragon Ball Super? Come on. No, I did, but it, the the big words you're using sound like Inspector Deck from Wu Tang Clan. It's like I bomb atomically. I was like, ooh, dang. It's like you're actually about to freestyle right now. He's ventured into the realm of the gods. And uh, the realm of the gods also uh, is where they call flagrant twos pretty dutifully. So uh, it's so interesting. So looking specifically at the 76ers in Brooklyn game, because it ties into the whole of what we've seen in officiating in the NBA. You were talking about it before the show with me. It's the playoffs, so we all expect an uptick in physical basketball. It's what we love yeah. about this time of year. We always hear about playoff fouls from the old school NBA guys and all those things down the line. But something does seem a little bit different just because so many of what we've seen has been so overt. We had the Draymond Green stomp on Demonis Sabonis yeah. that got him suspended yeah, for Game 3. We had mm -hmm. in this 76ers game with Embiid and Harden, Joel Embiid kickstarting the party early, getting the step over, the full Ty Lue treatment from Nick Claxton in that game, and mm. then kicking up at him as he mm. steps over the top. They go, he is <laughs> yeah. not assessed a flagrant two. He just gets, a, I believe, a flagrant yeah. one. 
and they keep it moving. <laughs> then we fast forward later in that game. Everyone's already kind of hot and bothered off that. It's extremely physical. Joel did that exactly. very early on. So now the fear is if you're not careful, you're going to lose him for the rest of the game if something pops off. Then we get James Harden at the top of the key getting guarded. Yeah, well, I mean, it is so interesting because like how I was as a player is not a goes flashy to swipe, so That's why I like watching, you know, can't see Hits for Buddy right the no-no so places. And, he and gets, that you now know, is what triggers the flavor at too. It's like someone else plays, loosening the jar of pickles a, you know, and then coming down, in at the last guy, second and finally getting the top off. Apparently down, that was James down, Harden because like Brandon, eight, that's you know, the only thing I can come right up with as to why Harden was ejected and Embiid was not. The severity of both completely different and can only lead me back to one place, which is because we go back to the 2016 postseason where we remember Draymond out here kicking people in the no-no places. We've obviously seen Chris Paul do that. And while I believe the NBA head of officiating that was on with TNT denied this, it seems to be that your accuracy in hitting people in the nuts is about the only consistent determinant of flagrant twos in the NBA. That's about all I can come up ah. with at this point. Or the fact that if you hit them with your hand versus your foot, Mike, because, you know, maybe – Feet are less controllable than the hands, which, you know, I don't know what the NBA refs are, are looking at. But I love that you can have a makeup call like this happen because that's what it felt like. As soon as it happened, it felt like a makeup call. Any, enough NFL fans and college football fans know makeup calls are all over the field, usually within the same half. This had a lot of time in between the two. But, hey, they got James making a basketball move with his hand and Royce O'Neal had the little clutch. That was what I was so confused about. Royce O'Neal threw his back back and then immediately toppled over when he felt like one well, testy got touched. Well, you know how that goes, though. It's a bit of a delayed reaction usually when you get hit down there, and it affects everything. It's like a lower back injury. You know, we always we always have to do that thing when you're in the broadcast booth and someone gets hit down there, and you're like, oh, yeah, it's a lower abdomen. He seems to be, you know, holding his yes. groin. We got all these words that we use. And so you say, like, yeah, he got kicked in the nuts. Like, that's, that's what happened, yeah. and it makes everything I, worse. Listen, I was playing basketball with Carter the other day, and he got me. And I couldn't articulate it to him. And all I could think of as a father is like, wow, how am I going to articulate to, to my son when he gets this first <laughs> happens to him? Because it happens to the best of us. And we all are the best of us. It does happen to the best. Yeah, what are you going to do when your young son gets hit there and you've got to explain, buddy, this is going to happen so many more times. Like, Brandon, I always say the worst thing that I ever think about is I haven't fallen down the stairs for the last time in my life. Like it's mm. happened before and statistically probability wise, it's going to happen again. And the same applies to getting hit down there. I have not weathered my last storm on that front. And so, yeah, how you explain that to someone going through it for their first time. I am not envious of your situation. That's hellish. Tummy ache, some, some sort of really deep <laughs> embedded belly button tummy ache. Uh, but yes, uh, back to the NBA, Mike. I, I feel like Joel Embiid is spending way too much time on the ground to be an MVP candidate for my liking. But like like we talked about off air, this really isn't that com com uh, competitive of a series. But I feel like the over-aggressiveness in the first round is really just to get these teams that aren't supposed to be there up out of there. And that's why the Warriors and the Kings are fighting the way they are because – they may be more evenly matched than a lot of us think they are. Yeah, you know what? That's probably the case. Because you're right. In the 76ers-Brooklyn series, the Sixers are up 3-0. The only lasting effect this can have is that now uh, Harden has two flagrant two points. And if you accumulate four in a playoffs, you get sat down for a game. It's the Draymond 2016 playoff run rule. And so that's something you certainly don't want out there. Now, heard Harden after the game was adamant that this was nonsense, that someone, especially with his lack of history of this kind of behavior, should not have been officiated like that in that moment. So Shame. it could have that lingering effect, but... You know, you still had in this game, uh, Tyrese Maxey went off again. James Harden was playing his best basketball of the series in this game. Had like 21-5-4 and four before he was ejected. But I think, you know, Tyrese Maxey doing what he's done in this series, he was so hot and cold during the regular season. Those are positive signs for this Sixers team. Joel is healthy. Harden is healthy. And so coming off this first round, yeah, this is aggravating. But at the end of the day, not all that detrimental for the Sixers. Now, if you're Brooklyn, you'd be arguing that Harden, or 
excuse me, Embiid should have been the one up out of there, and that would have mm-hmm. drastically affected things. That could have maybe changed the course of this series. We don't expect anything from that Sixers Brooklyn series to go the way of the Warriors series, where you've got a review, and now all of a sudden somebody is going to be suspended for the next game. That's what the Warriors had to weather with this Draymond situation, where same thing, like when we hear about what goes into making these decisions, it is uh, Kevin Pelton did a great article about this on ESPN.com severity of contact is it a legit basketball play is there wind up and follow through the potential for injury the severity of injury and what led to did it lead to an altercation and Joe Dumars the president of basketball operations also said with Draymond's case specifically it was because he's got a history of this it was agitated by the fact that he started going and riling up the crowd inside golden one when they were on the road Mm. and so if we factor all of these things into it it does kind of seem like you're rewarded for the cell because you talked about it when Harden hit Buddy down there there was the big cell Demonis Sabonis questionable for game three with chest contusions and (laughs) writhing around on the ground in a way that a lot of people thought was a little bit of an over exaggeration you're rewarded for the cell it seems like what the NBA has come out and said relative to these flagrant twos basically incentivizes you to go out there and act like you would on a flop that's to me one of the big takeaways from this is when in doubt especially and again high intensity playoff environments sell the hell out of that thing and you might be able to get this call in your favor because we have heard from now the horse's mouth that that is an aggravating factor but this is a slippery slope mike isn't it like uh, flops are now uh, penalized or uh, yellow carded uh, when it comes to soccer like i feel like we're getting closer to flops getting flagrant calls because it's leading when sabonis was on the ground moving around like a slug after draymond stomped on his chest i was like if you don't it was it was egregious. It was egregious, and I did not believe it. But you can never assess just how much in pain someone is. So it's always fair uh, fair game. It, it is, and you're right. The NBA has tried to start policing flops to an extent, but again, clearly, it can only go so far. And right now, it's sort of like offensive football in the NFL. You're going to have the advantage. In this case, the person selling is going to have the advantage because on the other side, we're talking about the best players on a lot of these teams or some of the best players. Like the fact that the Warriors stepped up and were able to do what they did going back home to Oracle in game three without Draymond, massive for that series. They've still got the problem where they have not been able to win on the road all year. Sacramento's got home court advantage in this series. And so that the specter looming for them but we talked about Draymond Green's ejection being one of these things that was going to potentially tilt the balance of this series and instead you went out there got vintage Steph Curry you got Kevon Looney who was great as a facilitator Golden State went nine for nine off Kevon Looney's passes and they finally decided to value the basketball like all of what we heard from Steve Kerr in those pre you know uh in-game interviews saying yeah we've always turned the ball over but you usually had better offense and better things to rely on to be able to overcome that. And so now they decide, all right, we're going to start to stave those off. They had 22 turnovers for 25 points in game two compared to just 12 turnovers for 17 points or for seven points off turnovers in game three. Brandon, Golden State had 20 or 19 offensive rebounds in game three. They only had 18 in games one and two combined. They decided to do the Mm. dirty work in this game without Draymond Green. And this goes back to why Draymond on that team can get away with everything that he does. Because what you heard from that locker room unanimously was, we won this game because of Draymond. Because we thought it was Mm. nonsense that he was held out of this game to begin with we know how important like it was all of the rah-rah get him fired up stuff that we saw him doing on the sideline when he got ejected in the first place it was this team realizing championship medal hey we know the importance of coming back and resetting the tone on our home court we know we've got to all pull the rope a little bit tighter as we've talked about because you know that going into the game and you're not losing him in the middle of the game, you can plan around it now. You can plan your rotation a little bit different. You can go a little bit deeper off the bench and you can structure your team the way they did and all know Draymond's usually the one that does a lot of that dirty work, right? Defensively, he's the guy that calls everything out for them. He's the one guy that helps them set a lot of their defense. And now without him, everyone's got to pull a little bit tighter. Everyone's got to get on the boards and do a little more of that work. And it paid off for them. And so they were able to weather the storm on that. But based on what we've seen so far, and again, in Kevin Pelton's article, he points out, 
We had 14 flagrant twos called this entire season. That's about one for every 88 games. We've had two in 17 games so far this year. There were only three flagrant twos called all of last year's postseason. So that would lead us to believe at the rate we're going, we're going to get more of these. And it's so interesting to think about the playoffs overall as, all right, this place where we've been used to this uptick of intensity and our officials doing extra to curb this or do I think the more likely outcome is or the more likely source of this is these have just been uncharacteristic playoff fouls because they're so overt two of them have involved kicks or swipes at the no-no place and one in Draymond was like an Albert Hainsworth level of overt stompery that we haven't really seen in a while so I think all those mixed together it's hard to be predictive with these things but I would hope that in the first round, we get this out of our system, and this doesn't meaningfully affect basketball as we keep going in the postseason because we have so much compelling stuff on the court, right? We haven't even gotten to the Clippers game where now all of a sudden that series seems to have turned. You've got Kawhi yeah. Leonard off the court now, Paul George on the off the court now. We're not sure when either of them are going to be back. And Russell Westbrook and company went out there and performed admirably, tried to keep it close, but... That series seems like it may have turned because of injury, which we know is a part of this process. We don't want any more series to turn because a guy's held off the court because of a flagrant foul. That's equal parts. Guys got to keep their composure. Like, I know there were a lot of people talking about the step over from Nick Claxton as an agitating factor. The angle grab Mm. from Damana Sabonis is an agitating factor. There's no doubt. But like we said, you're always going to catch the second guy. That's usually how this is going to go. Like, I don't know, Brandon, for you, the step over factor, is that carte blanche to do whatever you want? Is anything that comes after that understandable because the step over is such an egregious behavior on the court? I think it is. I think it is. I think it's something that they're trying to curb out of basketball. You're, you're saying that we, we might see this curved further on in the playoffs. I'm not sure if that's the case. I think Adam Silver, who loves intrigue, and, and I don't think really care who wins this at the end, is – giving prep talks to these referees before they go out there. It's like, all right, guys, you know, we got kids watching here. Anything that you see that looks like it could be on NBA Street or featured in a movie, uh, he got game. We don't want to see it on our court. And I think that we are looking at even more series turning. You're talking about the series turning because of injury. John Morant is currently out for the Grizzlies and may not return while they're getting ready to play the Lakers again tonight. So, I feel like we are just seeing the tip of the iceberg. I think a lot more people are going to get called out and and sent out of the game, ejected, for reasons that are going to make a lot of basketball fans scratch their head. Yeah, and I hope that's not the case. Because you're right, we're already dealing with enough as a basketball-watching public having so many of these stars off the court in pivotal moments. You mentioned Ja. Giannis has been dealing with that back injury um, with the Milwaukee Bucks that obviously didn't affect them a ton in Game 2. But still... It's looming overhead, and the one thing we know is nobody wants officiating directly affecting the outcome of a lot of these games. So I think it's a good reminder, too, we need more good old-fashioned brawls, right? If you're going to do Ooh. it, you got to do it in a scrum. What's the NBA been well-known for for years? Hold me back scrums where no one actually gets anything accomplished, right? And yeah. so for Joel Embiid, the mistake's not retaliating. The mistake is kicking as opposed to getting up. Now, I understand you're seven feet tall. Getting up is a much longer process. See Shaq every time he fell down. And Brandon, you pointed this out. Joel Embiid's got that Shaq quality where he does end up on the ground a lot for someone of his size. And so yeah. I know that's a process, but like if he had gotten up and just gotten in Nick Claxton's grill and you know maybe taken a swipe there or something, I don't think we're talking about nearly as much of a penalty on the back end. Potentially, I know he didn't get it. And then with Harden, that one even more inexplicable. Like the roles should have been flipped. If you had ejected Joel Embiid and then just penalized James Harden, I don't think anyone's getting up this morning reacting the way that they did. No, but I also think that it's dangerous to have supporting players out in the playoffs right like you're talking about brawls usually the dispensable players can go out there like hey, let's throw somebody out there to get some fouls and, and and you know really rough somebody up and and you know get Steph Curry off their game talking about Della Vadova uh, back in the day in the Cavs series but I really do think that this is we're going to see more of this and unfortunately it's not going to be the stars that go out as much as it's going to be no, I, no, it is the stars is going out. But I think it's a good well, that's, it's that's good what, for the NBA. It's good for the playoffs. About. It's good for the playoffs. I, I 
I think intensity is good for the playoffs. I think we've talked about it. I think villains are good for the playoffs, but we know attrition is going to happen. We don't need it to be brought on by officiating any more than it has been. Brandon, normally on Fridays we do turn-ons, things we're excited about watching over the weekend, like the Lakers and the Grizzlies series shifting back to Los Angeles on Saturday night. You know, plenty of the stuff that goes on in the sports world. We got NBA action wall-to-wall all weekend, but usually it's also a chance for us to talk about shows we're excited about watching, usually Sunday night HBO shows. Usually right now in the world we're in, it's Succession. And so imagine my surprise. We're coming off of episode three where we've got the most shocking revelation probably in the show's history. We move on to the fallout of that in episode four. I am watching all week, diligently taking notes, excited to break down the dynamic amongst the siblings right now. Is Kendall going to be someone that they can trust going forward? All of these things, Marsha back in the picture. And oh, to my surprise, I walk in only to be let down, bamboozled, run amok, and led astray by my partner. Logan died. I'm out. Brandon, I can't believe you just cut bait and run on this series after the most important moment. It's missing the whole point of the series. It was never about this parent and children's relationship. It was about power. It was about struggle. It was literally in the title. The series started about succession, and now we're actually getting to the succession point. Now you want to run? How dare you? There is no power without Logan Roy, but I'll check in. It's been a busy week. I don't know if you know. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. We'll give you some grace on that. Our succession recap will Thank just you. be doubled up next week. Maybe we'll invite dad back for that. Really get this thing going. Love we it. got that whole NFL draft thing too. So we'll try and get to all that. But Brandon, in the meantime, as we look towards what we're going to watch over the weekend, spoiler alert, it's NBA and NHL. It's on all weekend. It's the postseason. These turn-ons get a lot easier right now. Let's get to something that's also usually pretty easy. Three quick stories to end the day. This, that, and the third uh, as we send people on their merry way. And Brandon, let's start with this. Speaking of things people need to watch and uh, listen to, our friends over at Baseball is Dead, uh, specifically Dallas Braden, former MLB pitcher, one of the co-hosts there, and a guy who's still intimately associated with the Oakland Athletics. For now, as we saw, the Oakland A's have signed a binding agreement to purchase land near the Las Vegas Strip where they intend to construct a major league ballpark, according to uh, their team president, on Wednesday night. So Vegas is going to get a baseball team. Obviously, this city of Oakland has lost a lot in the way of their pro sports franchises. And Dallas Braden over baseball is dead. Cut a pretty moving tribute to what Oakland has been as a sports fan base. What do you have to say to the A's fans out there? Thank you. Thank you for loving the game unconditionally. Thank you for allowing the game to take a part of your soul and never give it back. That's what makes a day like today really hurt. Dallas Braden has thrown a perfect game. Something I've learned through tragedy, loss, and even triumph is the road traveled to those inevitable destinations is paved with memories filled with love and joy and tears of all kinds. From the arrival in 68 to our triplets in 72, 73, 74, the unforgettable season in 89, the images. There's been countless iconic moments that you have all shared together and that we have all been lucky enough to experience together at the ballpark over the years. And I wanted you folks to know just how much I love and appreciate you. I've been able to live out a fantasy my entire life and it's only because of incredibly dedicated and faithful fans like you. I am so terribly sorry. And please know that my heart is with yours. Uh, Brandon, really poignant stuff and a good reminder that for the outside world, for the rest of us, this is just Vegas continuing to get more of what we expected, right? It's becoming a bona fide sports town. We've got the Knights there. We've got the Raiders there. We got the Aces. They're just going to keep adding, but this is another major loss. There are people that have built their habits, their lifestyle around this, and it, it is always a sad day for sports fans. I remember seeing friends of mine in St. Louis go through this when the Rams left years ago, and now A's fans are going to join, unfortunately, that chorus of people yeah the Oakland A's are of all the teams that have left and gone out of Oakland 
this has got to hurt for them. Uh, you know, you got legends like Dave Stewart on the mound and obviously Dallas Braden with his, his perfect game. I don't know if there's going to be any healing anytime soon, but Vegas has another another draw. Yeah, no, they're, uh, again, just get it. Once we popped the lid open on that, it was only a matter of time before it continued to absorb. Speaking of absorbing people, Brandon, let's get to that. This one I'm just doing as a reminder to myself to remember this when we get to August. Because my favorite part of every fall when we start football season <laughs> is forgetting that certain coaches and players have moved to organizations that I didn't remember. And this is exactly yes. how I felt when I saw the announcement that Matt Patricia, former Lions head coach, Patriots D coordinator, turned Patriots kind of co-offensive coordinator, is now been hired as a defensive assistant for the Philadelphia Eagles on that defense. And so when we pop up into the preseason and Matt Patricia is inevitably seen somewhere in those Philadelphia green and he comes and picks a great year because they're going to bring back the kelly green jerseys to remember that that's a thing and that him and his rocket scientist pencil have now moved over to philadelphia which huge win for him to go from having to do a thing that's completely foreign to you at a place that you know to a thing that is completely your bag at a place that you don't know nearly as well got to be a nice switch up for him after whatever the hell last year was Matt Patricia lets everyone know, just keep chugging on. You'll find the landing spot. And I love that Nick Seriani consulted with Darius Slay before making the hire. Smart man. Always smart to listen to the players. More people should do it. Brandon, let's get to the third. This was interesting. And since on this podcast, you are known for a few things in particular, giving Los Angeles traffic directions, making sure everyone knows who is from or went to Louisville in Kentucky. And of course, anything that happens with the rapper Drake. In this case, it might be with his AI proxy. So, anyone listening to that might go, oh man, Drake put out a new track, a track uh, called Heart on My Sleeve featuring The Weeknd, and normally that'd be great, song of the summer potential, people be hot and bothered. Anyone that missed this one knows that this is actually an AI track. So, an artificial intelligence page put out the song Heart on My Sleeve that was released and went crazy viral over the weekend, and went out on YouTube, TikTok, Spotify, all these places before it was removed and scrubbed by Drake's record label. Now, Brandon, you saw this because Meek Mill was blasting it on the timeline, right? <laughs> Basically lauding it for what it was, when in actuality, this is starting to get kind of scary as sort of an existential crisis for music and everyone. Like, we're not that far away from them doing this with your favorite podcaster's voice. I think I've already seen that out there. The robots are coming for all of our jobs, and this is the latest installment of how real it's getting. Yes, Mike, that's why we have to get more crazy on these broadcasts we have to say more insane things drake has said the same thing over and over again that someone named ghost rider on tiktok was able to make a new hit song with him in the weekend also known as abel and no one was the wiser i want to listen to the song even more i'm glad it's still up on twitter and youtube so i can hear it but it is a little bit sad that drake is as rudimentary to be mimicked by a computer AI is sort of occupying the space that NIL does in college where the change is far outpaced, the regulation around it going to be wild to watch yes. what the music industry and others do with this. We hope this was wild to watch for you. If you enjoyed this, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, and review. Leave us a five-star rating. And, of course, check us out. Watch us on the DraftKings YouTube channel under the Gojo of Michael Jr. tab. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you Monday. Boom. Money in the bank.